Um, so yeah, let's, let's start with a quick introduction. So uh, my name is Lawrence. I'm responsible for developer relations within AV System. Um, and together with me, I have Alexander, who is one of the most knowledgeable, knowledgeable person <laughs> I know within the company, um, mostly responsible for the embedded side. But Alexander, maybe you want to share a few words about yourself? Uh, yeah, so my name is Alexander uh, Witlovich, and I'm a software engineer at AV Systems Embedded Team, where I work on Andre, uh, our Latin Latin client, and various integrations of that for many different platforms, uh, including the Zephyr integration, about which uh, we will also be talking today. Thanks. Perfect. All right, let's start sharing my screen and kick off the presentation. So there is a chat. Um, <clears throat> so if you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to drop them in the chat and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. Um, and um, yeah, I'll start with a brief introduction about the Lightweight M2M protocol, the Lightweight M2M standard. I'll give you a bit of information about the firmware over the air update process and specifically how the lightweight M2M specifications designed this process. Um, and we will end with a live demo using the Thingy 91 uh, Nordic dev kit, which contains the NRF 9160 chipset. Um, so how to run photo updates using lightweight M2M and Zephyr. Um, and we'll end with a QA and and I'm trying to keep to limit everything within 25, 30 minutes. So we have another, let's say 10 minutes or so for questions. Good, lightweight end to end. Um, I think most of you at least are familiar with the name, but lightweight end to end is an application layer IoT standard. And it's really designed to simplify the whole development process of IoT devices. And I don't know, first question people always ask, okay, like why is there a need for another, yet another IoT standard? Well, um, let me explain. Still, the IoT market, as of the day, it's, it's still much of, of a wild west. Everyone is building their stuff on their own property. Everyone decides the rules for themselves on how devices need to behave, on how they need to respond to server commands, on what security implementations are being embedded. And usually if, if a new IoT project is being initiated, then people start from scratch and having to reinvent the wheel all over. So back in 2017, a few very smart guys set together and he started collecting all of these best practices from the IoT market. And they tried to and put that together into this standardized way of IoT development. So it's a collection of best practices it's a kind of framework on how IoT applications should ideally be designed. And one of the core principles of Lightweight M2M is device management. And device management starts from the process where devices are being provisioned, so once they are being deployed in the field, and it contains all of the mechanisms for the server to control those devices remotely. So if you want to update configurations or firmware, then they're, they're very easy and clever ways to do so. And firmware updates over the years, one of those device management features that comes in very handy because it's, it's considered, I, sh I think I can say, as one of the more complicated aspects of IoT development. So I'll, I'll give them some more examples later on in the presentation. So interoperability is key to lightweight M2M. And it means that if you embed this standard, if you follow this standard, then any server that also adheres to the standard can connect with any device and vice versa. And one of the reasons and one of the benefits by using this open protocol is that you can easily change vendors over time. Definitely with these IoT devices that have long battery lives of five to 10 years, like you never know what's happening throughout the process. So, over time, you can actually, with a few simple commands, you can change the server settings over time, allowing the device to connect to a new server, completely avoiding lock-in. And it comes with some additional benefits like security by design. I can talk about that for ages, but 
um, for, for this presentation, I mostly want to dive into the benefits of this lightweight M2M standard way of working to update firmware over the air. And just a bit of information about this, this standard. So the, the core principles, the core architecture is that it comprises of two components. It, it, it contains the client, which runs on the end device, and the server, which runs on the cloud. And optionally, there is a third cloud component, which is what we call the bootstrap server. And the bootstrap server is a, let's say, an, an, an virtually isolated component where the device can connect to. And by using this bootstrap server, um, it, it sends basically the, the session keys to, those, the, to the devices connected to it and provides the instructions on how to connect to a lightweight M2M server. Well, there are different implementations out there. So there are actually quite a lot of open source implementations of lightweight M2M clients. So we provide our own. We got the NJ client. Um, so the one that we are using today is the Zephyr lightweight M2M clients. Um, but also Eclipse Foundation has two open source versions. And also there is another proprietary one from IOTerop, which is one of our competitors. And same applies for the lightweight M2M server side. So the server that we're using during this demo that we developed ourselves is called Coyote, but there are also some alternatives out there in the market. So a core principle of this standard is what we call smart objects. So if you talk about an IoT device, then it's, it's basically a collection of objects, a collection of features and functionalities that together form an application. And that can include temperature sensors or specific peripherals like a GPS module that is implemented on the device. Um, but there's also specific objects for, let's say, the security implementation. And it comprises all the security settings and, and parameters that is, that, that's implemented on the device. Um, same for device information. And that, that object contains, let's say, the name of the device, obviously the serial number, um, you could include the IMEI or the ICCID when you're working with cellular devices. And also the, the, the firmware over the air up, um, firmware update over the air um, functionality is one of those objects that you can implement on your device. And all of these, these objects are standardized in the object and resource registry. And it's uh, the, the object and resource registry is a public database that you can access that can help you with, with, with um, um, processing all of the device features. And with the smart objects com comes an interoperable data format. So there is a kind of a common language that the standard defines on how to communicate between the device and the server and what kind of the data format um, needs to be used. And I'm trying to give you an example that hopefully clarifies how this data format looks like. So let's assume you start sending GPS locations. So you have latitude and longitude that you want to send from the device to the server. So the identifier for the object of location is number six. Well, you can look that up in the resource, um, object and resource registry. But you should, I know, like know for me that that, that the location object is based on is based is, has the ID six. Then the next um, uh, digit is the object instance idea, and sometimes devices have multiple implementations or multiple, let's say, sensors embedded, and then you can make a distinction between what specific sensor you're referring to by using an op like a specific identifier. So in our case, we just have one GPS sensor, so it's just simply a zero. And then under each object, there is a list of resources. So you have on the highest level, you have the, um, the, the location resource and as the location object, and as the resource, you have latitude, longitude, optionally latitude uh, or altitude, and that's all defined by a resource ID. So eventually that leads us to the URI 600 or 601, followed by the actual sensor data that we are sending. And if we send this specific array, then the server knows, okay, the value that I'm seeing now is latitude and longitude data. 
So hopefully that's clarified, that clarifies more or less how this works and we can dive into more in detail where needed. So this device management. So we have the provisioning process defined. So it's there's a clear path towards the initial um, uh, initiation of the device and the connection to the server. So this is all defined in this provisioning flow. And also what I briefly mentioned is that is also this bootstrapping service for key derivation is all being defined. And then there's this remote management. And it's very similar to normal REST APIs, which you might know from web development. So you have standardized what we call operations to instruct the device on how to behave. So for example, the server can um, send a read operation asking for a specific um, a sensor reading to, to, to receive. We can also write a specific um, a variable, for example, to change the color of an LED, or you can execute a command and that could result in, let's say, a reboot or a factory reset or a firmware, firmware update. And these are kind of the standardized way on how to interact with the devices. And then finally, the firmware over the air update is also a core element of this device management. So FOTA, firmware over the air, which has many names. FOTA, uh, DFU, device firmware updates, over the air, DFU, FOTA, FUOTA. There are many different elements that you can um, call it. And um, key to the success of um, a photo update is that you need to understand a little bit how flash works. So flash is non-volatile memory that lives on the IoT device. And usually flash memory is um, divided into multiple sections or what we call multiple partitions. Um, so in, let's say the main partition or whatever you will call it, lives the main application firmware. So in this Example, we call it I don't know, firmware version 1.2. And then you have a second partition and that's reserved for updates or like new firmware. Um, so if there's a new firmware update, then this other partition is used to basically store the new firmware image. And there are two other uh, like uh, partitions that I will uh, cover in a second. So once the new firmware is available, then I don't know the server informs the device that a new firmware image is available and the device starts downloading the firmware image. So in partition one, at some point, it started downloading the firmware and then contains version 1.3. So once the download has been completed, the bootloader is being activated. And the bootloader sees that there is a new firmware image available in this specific update partition. And the bootloader then validates authenticity and integrity of that new firmware image. And once that has been uh, validated, it initializes a reboot. And the reboot, um, and after the reboot, the um, firmware is being swapped. And it depends a bit on the bootloader you're using. But for the example, today we're using the bootloader called MCU boot to swap those two images. And how it works in practice is that um, partition zero is being written to the scratch partition. Um, partition one is being written to partition zero. And then eventually the scratch partition is being written to partition one. I hope you got that. So that basically means that the two partitions are being swapped. And then after a reboot, the bootloader starts initiating the new firmware, version 1.3. And if everything went well, then the device then automatically starts running the new firmware after this successful reboot. But in case some error is being, um, is being found or some issues are being uncovered, then the device can initiate a rollback. And it basically means that it redo redoes the swap um, um, procedure. And again, those two partitions are being swapped. So eventually we return to the initial state and version 1.2 um, is being rewritten to partition zero. And after a reboot, that initial firmware image is being um, used again. So hopefully that's clear. Um, enough theory here. 
there's one more thing I want to highlight before going into the demo. And that's that this specific object five, which contains the features of the, uh, or contains the capabilities of the firmware update um, has four different states. And you can see that in a second throughout the demo. Um, and those four different states are defined as idle, downloading, downloaded, and updating. So idle is before and after the update. Well, I think downloading is quite clear. Uh, downloaded is basically once the download is being finished and the authenticity and integrity is being validated. And updating is basically once those two images are being swapped. And next to these update states, there are also update results. And the Lightweight and 2 m standard defines a couple of most, the most common update results um, that I know you can see is the end of the um, update procedure. So ideally you wanna see the result one, which means that the update has been successfully completed, but there are also numerous reasons why the download could have failed, like insufficient flash memory or connection loss, for example. Different ways where like how the update could go wrong is like an invalid URI or unsupported protocol. And Throughout the update process, you can actually keep track of the state and the update results. So you get informed about the process of the updates. Good. Um, I think that's enough talking for now. So we move on to the demo. So if there are any questions in the meantime, feel free to drop them in the chat. So here I have my... Um, uh, here I have my uh, Coyote dashboard, which is the overview of my connected device. And as I mentioned, I am using the Thingy 91 development kit. Um, and here in the overview page, you can see all of the over the 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 I don't know the over information. You can see that it's registered. You can see that last seen about 20 seconds ago, and and some further metadata. Then if you go to the data model, then you can see all of those objects that I that I referred to a few minutes ago. So there are uh, information and configurations about the server, about the device, for example, the manufacturer, the model number, um, but also the battery levels are defined here. Um, it contains a couple of sensors, and here you also can see the firmware update object. So here you can see that the state is set to zero, which means that the state as now is idle because I know, you haven't started the update process yet. Um, I did run a test just before the webinar, so you can actually see that the update result already turned to one. But if you haven't done so in the past, then you can see that the initial value would be zero. So what I'm trying to do with the firmware update is that I'm trying to add new functionality to this device. And specifically, I want to add an additional object through a firmware update. And um, I want to add specifically the accelerometer object. So after the update, I want to see the X, Y, and Z values of this specific device. So for doing so, I'll go to the firmware update tab. And actually the initial phase is quite straightforward. Um, and to be able to read the logs of the device, I'm going to connect the USB cable so I can read the server logs or I can read the logs throughout the update process. And it I don't know, gives you some insight about what's actually happening on the device level. So I click firmware update. And for this example, I use the, the basic firmware update feature I know, I'm going to upload a new one. So I already prepared a new firmware image. Um, so I go to the Zephyr folder um, and I select the app underscore update dot binary. I, know, I can give it a name. And I click save. And then here there are two ways on how to push or how to, to, to send the new firmware image to the device. So we have the pull method and we have the push method. And the pull method, we basically send the URI 
of the um, server that the device can use to download the firmware. When using the push method, then we directly push the new firmware image on the device. So as of now, I, I use the pool method. Um, and depending on the firmware you run on the device, you can I don't know, define the image transport type. So uh, in my case, for this specific uh, firmware, I'm using um, UDP um, and co-op as the transport uh, layer. So click next and I click schedule updates. And then hopefully the um, uh, demo will be conducted successfully, but at least you directly see that there's something in progress and it started preparing the updates. And if I go to the, um, the logs of my device, then I can see that actually the, the firmware now directly starts downloading. So the size is 330 KB in size, give or take. Um, and if the connection stays stable, stable then it should be uh, downloaded probably in a, in a minute or two. Um, so you can see the exact state of what's happening in this process. And there are kind of I don't know, sub steps. So you can always keep track of what's happening. And as I mentioned, you can always go back to the data model and open up this firmware update. And if I quickly do a refresh, then here you can see that the package URI is being sent to the device, meaning that the device knows the address which it uses to download the firmware. And as you remember, the state used to be zero, and now the state is defined as one, meaning that the firmware image is being downloaded. So let's go back to the firmware update uh, and also open up the, um, the, the the device logs. And it's it's still 330 KB, so it, it will take a little bit of time before the full image um, has been downloaded by the device. So we are we're waiting patiently. Um, and, uh, and and let's see how the next steps are being unfolded. Um, I already see that there is a question coming up, so we're going to address that in a second. Um, still waiting for the full firmware download to be completed. And you can also see here the duration of the full process opening up some of these sub steps so you can see what's what's kind of happening um, um, underneath this uh, this this UI so initializing setting the initial observations resetting the state machine and writing package URI as you have you seen which is the I know the the, the link to the um, the database where the device can download the firmware and eventually it's now in the process of downloading uh, the firmware. And here, once that has been completed, then it starts executing the resource updates, waiting for the update to finish, checking new version, and eventually doing some final cleanup. We're seeing that we're almost there, 98, 99%. And let's see. So download has been complete, uh, waiting for the device to reboot, reboot in progress. I noticed that there are some errors being given. And as far as I know, that has to do with the connection that breaks because the device is in a reboot. So the, 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 the connection with the server then breaks. So the reboot is being conducted and hopefully the device starts booting up successfully. And here you can also see that the package um, I don't know, has been transferred and the update is now being executed. And there we see something. So we see that the device now reboots. It starts initializing the modem. It finished the accelerometer calibration. It actually refers that the um, new object is being activated. And here we can see that the firmware has been successfully updated.
well, don't believe the server or the, the logs right away. So let's actually see what Coyote, what the dashboard reports. So here we can see that it successfully went through all of these steps and the update has been conducted successfully. And then let's go to the data model. And if we refresh here, then we see new object appear, which is the accelerometer. And that includes the X, Y, and Z values. So um, this far, the firmware update has been conducted successfully. Um, final few words about AV system before we go to the Q&A. So yeah, as I mentioned, AV system is a, is a, is a company based in Poland with a global um, a customer base. And um, the, the core of the IoT department has basically two core features, two core products. And the one is the Coyote platform. That's the one that I just demonstrated, which is the IoT platform that manages all of the devices running lightweight M2M clients. Um, it gathers data. You can use it to manage devices either individually or, or fleets of devices. Um, and you can use it as an intermediate service to kind of forward data to I know, your own endpoint, whether it's an Azure database or AWS IoT core or some kind of custom endpoint that you can set up yourself. And at the other hand, we have the NG, IO, NJ IoT SDK, which is an open source lightweight M2M client, uh, which is not what we use today because I know we went for the Zephyr client, but it, I know it's another alternative to um, the lightweight M2M client. So uh, this for the presentation, if you want to learn more and if you want to get your hands dirty and try this out this yourself, now feel free to go to avsystem.com. You can also set up a free account. So we have a developer service where you can set up um, 10 devices free of charge. So feel free to try it out yourself. I warmly invite you to do so. And then let's go back to where, let's go to the q and I see a few questions started appearing. So Alexander, feel free to jump back in. Uh, okay. Because uh, I, I back ask, again. ask Alexander to help out here because he's way more knowledgeable about all of the kind of under technical layers underneath this protocol. Yeah, so I will start with the, with the first question from Sylvain. Uh, so the question is, can you encrypt the firmware? And actually, there, there are two layers uh, on which you can encrypt the firmware. So the first of all is the transportation layer. By that, I mean that you can use a secure uh, transportation protocol uh, for the firmware. So you are using either DTLS or TLS to transport the image. But then obviously the image itself, which is later loaded into the bootloader, can be obviously encrypted. And it's, for instance, supported out of the box in MCU boot, which is used in Zephyr. As for the latest and 12 uh, Pimer update uh, objects are simply binary blobs. So latest and 12 doesn't handle uh, the key management. It rather just passes the data, uh, which is like, transparent to the latent data protocol. But it, it is like, it can be handled by the, by the bootloader that is working underneath. And as for the different keys for, for batches of devices, uh, in Coyote DM, there is possibility to uh, group devices. And I believe you should be able to uh, def define a separate group of devices in Coyote DM, which would use a separate uh, key uh, for the encryption of that image. So it, it, it's possible to do that, I think. Uh, did, you, did I answer your question correctly? <laughs> cool, and if not, feel free to drop another message in the chat so we can, uh, we can dive yeah. more yeah. in detail. Okay. So let me right. ask you the, the, the next one. So for Mark, is there an advantage for using package URI and let the device do the firmware download instead of pushing the firmware to the device with the right operation? Uh, yeah, so the difference is pretty important. Uh, the first of all is that if you are using uh, push mode in Latitude and 2 to push the image, uh, it's a process which takes uh, a longer while. Like you've seen on the demo, it took like two or three minutes to download the image. 
and that will totally stall the latent and client. It's only possible to do one operation at a time. While when you are using pull mode, then you can multiplex uh, the connection. Actually, when you are using pull mode, another socket is opened, and that can be that can be downloaded in parallel. So that's the first difference. And the second one is that you may want to use a different protocol for downloading the image. So uh, object number five supports not only co-op over UDP, but also co-op over TCP and HTTP. And for larger images, HTTP might turn out to be a faster method of downloading that image compared to co-op. So there is definitely an, an uh, advantage, I would say. Nice, perfect, Alexander. Um, so I think part of the question from Muhammad is, is also relating to this push and pull. Um, uh, the question is Mark also asked, but he also asked, so how would you uh, recommend handling unreliable LTE connections? Uh, okay, so uh, there is one way uh, in which you can uh, deal with that in that end to uh, So if you are using pull mode, uh, then it's possible to uh, use a extension in COP, uh, which is called. Actually, uh, I don't recall the name. I will have to. Oh, sorry, I, I recall the, uh, just now. Uh, it's called Etax. So, if your server that serves the images supports Etax, you are able to uh, use that information uh, after a reboot uh, to know that the server is still like exposing the same image and start the download not from the beginning of the uh, firmware but right from the middle, from the point where you have uh, ended downloading it previously and when your uh, connection was erupted. So that's one way of handling unre unreliable connections uh, when doing the photo. So you say that's and, basically additional implementation um, to this standard photo object. Yeah, well, basically it's it, use, it uses what co-op provides and co-op is used in a lower layer of latent and web, so yeah, that, that right. that's it. Gotcha. Uh, it's called Etag. Uh, it's, it's actually an extension that is available in both co-op and the HTTP. So Etag is like a cache or identificator of uh, some object you download over HTTP or co-op, and by using the Etag, you can be sure that uh, after rebooting and Looking at the at the, the same address, you are totally sure that the image hasn't changed, and you can start the download right from the middle, not from the beginning. Perfect. Thank you. Um, there's another question from Mark. Um, can you say something about having different incompatible versions with the smart objects? Let's say an object, an update changes the update in the objects in the firmware. Um, uh... Actually, I'm not sure uh, of what kind of incompatibility uh, do you think? Maybe you could um, explain it a little further. Yeah, so feel free, Mark, to add a few more so notes. So as, 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 for, as for the version of smart objects, uh, well, Lighted N2M uh, obligates the client uh, to expose to the server information uh in which the in, in which version uh, the object is oh so like changing results in the object yeah so basically in latent and when you define an object and then you want to change the resources then you are obliged to uh, change also the version of the object which is reported to the server and then if you upload all of the definitions of that object the XM, xml files that define that object uh, to the server then server can uh, use the proper xml to then read out the data uh, on the server side uh, and interpret it and everything else. So that is generally handled handled by Latit and well. Perfect. Well, there's a question from Sylvain about uh, LoRa 1. Did you ever try running an update through LoRa 1? Uh, I haven't personally, but our team is uh, working generally on getting into LoRa 1 and trying to uh, port our SDK uh, using LoRa 1 binding for that and to M, but that's something that is uh, a work in progress for now. Yeah. So maybe following up on this, um, a question from my end, because now in this example, we use the Zephyr client. 
or actually, I, I got to be honest, in fact, it is a fork from the Nordic, uh, from Nordic semiconductors. And that actually forked the, um, the, the, the repository from this every client. And I think they made some minor adjustments to make it I know, easier to work with on their specific hardware. But Alexander, maybe you can highlight okay, what actually the difference between the Zephyr client and the NJ client, which, I know, which you're one of the developers of. Uh, yeah, so there's a couple of differences. Uh, the first one is the availability on which platforms the client can run. So Zephyr uh, Latin Ethereum client obviously is uh, integrated with Zephyr and it uses the Zephyr APIs directly. Therefore, it is able to work on, the, on Zephyr apps. While Anje is written in a different way. Actually, the core of Anje is platform agnostic and you can port it to many platforms only implementing like a thin abstraction layer above the system we are working on. And obviously in case of Zephyr, we provide a ready to go implementation as for many other platforms. And you can simply include Anjay as a Zephyr module. So that's not shipped with the Zephyr instantly, but you can easily include it in your project. Uh, the other thing is a pretty different API approach. So Zephyr's client API is generally speaking much more low level which gives a finer control uh, over some mechanism and has a little lower flash footprint. But on the other hand, it requires much more work to get started working. And Anjay is providing rather high level APIs that try to pre-implement as much log logic as possible and they prioritize strict and conformance to the standard. And obviously since Anjay is platform agnostic, like I said earlier, uh, the API is common for all platforms. And the third thing, uh, very important uh, is the support. So Zephyr client is developed by and uh, developed and maintained by the community, while Anjay is developed by AV system. And besides the support you might get from our GitHub or Discord, you can also order a commercial support package uh, from our team. Uh, but to sum up, like both choices have their pros and cons, and it's a strong matter of preference. But most importantly, in the end, they both properly implement latent and protocol. So your device will connect to any Latin and server, no matter which client you choose. So that's the power of Latin and that you, in the end, you have that great, great interoperability, right? Perfect. Thank you. So I want to go to the last question. And unless there's another question popping up, I think we can leave it there. Maybe following up on this, I'm not sure if this is too technical for this uh, webinar, but Sylvain also asked, like, what are the requirements for the SDK? For example, the footprint or the, or the memory used. Uh, yeah, so I believe like for the core SDK, uh, I think you would need like at least uh, I believe what, 100, 100, 100 to 150 uh, kilobytes of flash, which is like the basis, and then you need to add a DTLS stack on top of that, uh, and depending on the features you include in the application that obviously can get lower on or grow. Uh, we try to have our SDK as conf as configurable as possible in that matter. As for the memory, uh, I think like having 20, maybe 30 kilobytes of heap, that should be enough for running a basic application using Anjay. So that's for the requirements. Perfect. Okay. So one more question popping up. Are there any restrictions on the commercial usage of NJ that you're aware uh, of? Yeah. So it, it depends actually on the case. So the license for NJ, uh, yeah, it's not Apache anymore. Uh, but in, if you are connecting uh, devices made using NJ to our cloud, then it doesn't limit you from the number of devices you build. Uh, if you would like to connect uh, your devices to other clouds, then you can have for free up to 100k devices, which is like actually a big number. And only after if you really, really uh, scale up, then you would need to come with an agreement with us to use it there. Anyways, the code itself is still open source. So the, the, like the biggest benefit of you know being able to dive into the implementation and compile it from no matter target you want, uh, is still possible. And you can, you are also free to experiment it with. So this stays. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much for answering all these questions, Alexander.
Um, if there are any more questions, then feel free to join our Discord. So discord.avsystem.com. So I know we're always available there and that's usually the fastest way to get support. Um, or drop me or Alexander a message directly. So uh, thank you so much for listening in. Thank you so much, Alexander, for helping out with all these technical questions. And yeah, I'll thanks a lot. You it was a pleasure. I'll send you a follow-up email in case you want to learn more. And again, I warmly invite you to try it out yourself and get first-hand experience with Lightweight M2M and with Coyote. Thank you so much and hope to see you again next time. Yeah, thanks everyone.